Okay. Let's see if I have any throat left in me after that. Okay. I am way behind. I didn't even get the print off my thing, so I'm using my iPad just to keep it on my notes there. So uh, hopefully I won't get too jostled going back and forth. We are uh, talking about the Christmas story, and we're familiar with that. There's a couple different passages that deal with that. Uh, the one yeah, specific. Or how do you, I can't remember how you do it. That's my mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> I know it's uh, they're they're here in spirit and on the mic. So, okay. Our scripture reading was from Matthew 2. Uh, I won't read all of that again. I punished Colin for reading so many verses already. Uh, but at the end is the, is the point that um, I really want to make or talk about this morning. Uh, the materials that were gifted uh, are interesting to me, and that's what we're going to dig in today. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You may have at least, you are at least familiar with these from what we just read this morning, or if you've gone to a Christmas program at all, there, that's often gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But frankincense and myrrh are, other than that, typically not mouth at all during the rest of the year, unless you are from those countries who use those heavily, or you are a person who uses those because you are from that country or you do particular practices. They are, they are common, just not in the United States. Uh, I don't know how common they are in Europe either, but uh, Asian, uh, near Asian, African, uh, Middle Eastern cultures still use myrrh and frankincense quite a bit, and actually they are they are pricey. Uh, they are expensive, but they are they are common practiced every day in people's homes and households uh, for religious reasons, for personal reasons. There's there's therapeutic uh, benefits from those two. We are all familiar with gold, I think. I'm looking at. Most hands and necklaces in here, people are familiar with gold. Glasses, it's, gold is common. Gold is used in very many things you may not even be aware of. It's used in electronics, and it's used in just about, uh, I mean, any, anything that, that runs on software has gold in it in, so, in some capacity, maybe not everything, but, um, but gold is obviously a commodity we are more familiar with. But these gold, frankincense, and myrrh are gifts given to the Jesus child uh, as a child from the so-called wise men. And we had a great Sunday school about who these wise men are. Uh, I refer back to Bug Laura. If you have more questions on that, we're not digging into that part this morning uh, for this message. But Sunday school was fantastic in exploring that a little bit more. And these wise men traveled from afar. How do we know firefighters are smart people? Because wise men traveled from afar. Far. But I'm ching. I wish we had a percussionist because man, I, I really need that right now. I love, this is, this is the best, this is the best kind of joke because no one really laughed. They're all just shaking their head at me. That's the, that's exactly what I wanted. I don't need any guffaws. I just need some response like that. That's fantastic. Okay, these wise men are probably wise, but that's not what the term really means, uh, again, as we explored in Sunday school. But they offer these things, and I believe because they are who they are, there was a purpose for why they offered these things. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now these have been taught on over the years. I'm not the first to teach on gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, I'm sure you're going to hear it again, maybe even during this Christmas season, but you'll hear it in subsequent Christmas seasons. It is a big part of the Christmas story. I'm going to talk about some of what I have found the more common understandings or the more commonly taught 
aspects as to why these gifts were the gifts chosen. I also have uh, a little bit different of a spin, and I will explain why and what those are as we get to that point. So we have three gifts. The first one represents royalty. This is an open question. Does anyone know which one is commonly used to represent royalty? You can just all say it, gold. Okay. So gold, it's thought that is representing this young child, Christ, as the king, as the future king, as the current king, as king of the universe, and whatever past, present, or future, it doesn't matter. That he is king and, and the gold is representing his royalty in some way. Now, what do you think represents sacrifice? Mm, I switched it. Good job, Jim. Myrrh. Not frankincense. Bam. Myrrh. Myrrh as sacrificial lamb. And we'll look at some verses that are uh, used to substantiate these, these, uh, these reasons here for what these items mean. Uh, but myrrh uh, as a sacrificial lamb. And then we have worship. There's only one left, and you have the cheat sheet on your paper. <laughs> what is the last one then? Frankincense, that's right. Frankincense, that word that every single time I try to type it into Google comes up Frankenstein or something. I have had a hard time learning how that word is spelled. Even my youngest daughter this morning looking at my notes as I'm looking over them myself says, Frankincense, that's a weird word. And I said, you're right, it is. It's difficult in our language. But this is an important uh, incense, fragrance, uh, sap, actually, that is used in worship. And for Christ, it is worshiping the fact that he is recognizing his Messiahship. The Messiah is the Savior. That is what Messiah means. He is Jesus the Christ. Christ meaning Messiah, meaning Savior. He is uh, one to be worshipped. This is one they were looking for to come and set his kingdom up in the world. So we have these three, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. See how many times I say that list today. I'm going to show some verses here that substantiate each one, but I'm going back to the, the list you're used to, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So this isn't uh, the way I tricked you. Sorry about tricking you. First one is gold. From Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is the head of the government, so to speak. And the government doesn't necessarily mean uh, it is a form of government we're familiar with. It's really more he is the head of whatever economy he is going to rule with. But he is going to be taking care of that, and he will receive it on his own. It goes on to read in Isaiah, if you want to follow along in your Bible, verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from the time this time forward or that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So this is a future kingdom that we're talking about here. Now we have frankincense, Luke 9, 20. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God, the Messiah of God, one who we should recognize and worship. Lastly, we have myrrh. This is something, I've got a couple of verses for this. This is something that uh, is actually a part of his crucifixion story as well. Uh, the, another aspect is a part of his getting being prepared in the tomb. Mark 15, 23 reads, Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, and he did not take it. This is on the road. They find another person to help carry the cross with him, and then they try to they give Jesus, because he's already been whipped and beaten, Go, uh, water mixed with myrrh, and many people believe that there's kind of an antiseptic quality to myrrh. There are medicinal qualities to frankincense and myrrh, and then in a, if it's used in that way, it's kind of a numbing agent. It kind of takes away the pain, and he rejects it. 
He wants to, f to feel the entirety of what he is there for, to take on the sin of the world. There's also from John 19, which I don't have a slide for, verses 38 through 40, if you want to follow along. John 19, 38 through 40. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. So God, Christ is dead now at this point. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with, with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. So it is used as a, uh, uh, an anointing oil for, a, for someone who has passed, and that's what they were going to do. They're going to anoint Christ in a way, uh, prepare his body for the grave. So these are at least, I know there's, there are other ones. There's lots of, uh, of different things uh, that people say as to these, but they're all similarly, they're all similar, and I believe kind of sum, these kind of sum these up. Uh, in my opinion, it's, this is my opinion, so I know you may have something subtly different, and I have an even different opinion than these three, though I think these are close. I'm going to take us in a different direction. What? Uh, Jesus what? says of himself in John 2, 13 through 22, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who, set, who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. And then continuing from 18 to 21, to slide up here on if you want to see that. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Verse 22, Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and he believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. So Jesus here is representing, he is saying, using the temple as an example of his own body. And we read in Hebrews, Hebrews 10, and I'm going to read the bulk of it. I will put up the point on the screen uh, that I want to emphasize. Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with the same, these same sacrifices, which they can offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would, not, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Why is that? Therefore, when he came into the world, here we go. He said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. This is Jesus speaking of himself. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, and I am here. All of these things were written of me, and I am here now to do your will, O God. And that is even a reflection of the Garden of Gethsemane prayer where he is praying, Thy will be done, even though he is suffering greatly and is, is struggling with some uh, whether or not he wants to take this cup. But he ultimately surrenders to God's will because this is the program that God has uh, ordained from before the foundations of the world. We'll continue on. Verse 8. Previously saying, sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. 
by that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The first and the second that's mentioned in this are the covenants, the testaments that were given. The first covenant, the first testament was that of Moses. When God gave the, new, the testament to him, we would sum it up in the, the Ten Commandments, but there's way more than that, way more to it than that, I should say. There's much more detail to it. And now Christ is offering these, the second testament, the second covenant. That's why he, part of the reason why he has come. The tabernacle and its laws given to Moses represented Jesus. They were, on the, uh, they were an example or figure for what was to be fulfilled in him. And indeed, many things are still be uh, in need of fulfilling. And if you look at the festivals and you look at the practices that uh, apparently will even go on in the millennial kingdom, there are still things to be done. There are still things that have yet to be accomplished. But he has already progressed into that system with his death, burial, and his resurrection. So what are we talking about here? We are not talking necessarily about the big temples that are built uh, in all their glory. We're talking about the meager one that was built in the wanderings of Israel, We're talking about the tabernacle of Moses. And this is uh, not the schematic that Moses was given. This is just, you know, obviously, this is just a uh, a representation of what it may have looked like, where things might have been. There's obviously, there's plenty of these out here that have subtle little differences, and you're welcome to look at them. I just pulled this one up, honestly, because it was the clearest image I could find. It was The other ones all had different tilts and everything, and they were kind of hard to see. I just wanted a nice, plain, top-down look at what we have here. And there are three general parts to the temple. You have the Holy of Holies, or Most Holy Place. You have the the holy place just outside that and that is where uh, most of the uh, many well many of the things that are blessed and offered and sanctified to be used are in these areas here the most holy place was not to be entered really at all they they there's all kinds of stories about how they took care of uh, the the priests to make sure that if anything went wrong or they did made one step wrong that they could get them out of there without other people going in there and dying. There are stories uh, if you love I love First and Second Samuel I love Joshua through First and Second Samuel I think is my my favorite uh, chunk of the Bible because there's just talk about drama talk about you know there's excitement in there where someone would make some movies of those things but keep them accurate. But there are times where they are conquered. The conquering people take the Ark of the Covenant and then they die. Or some the Ark of the Covenant starts to slip and someone puts their hand on it to try to save it and they die. This is, God, this is representing God's holiness not to be trifled with, not to be messed with. It is pure holiness and he cannot have sin that is unacceptable to him at least. Enter the Ark of the Covenant. Now he made a way for that. And we'll get into that via the mercy seat. And then outside of these two are uh, the burnt uh, the altar of burnt offerings, the bronze labor where the priests washed themselves. The burnt offer, uh, lay, uh, altar of burnt offerings is where they did the burnt offerings. That's why it's called that. But that's typically the sin offerings. But there were other offerings as well. All sorts of offerings going on. And then there were other parts outside the tabernacle. But these were the three main ones within the tabernacle. What I find interesting uh, about these things is that God was very clear to Moses that you have to make it exactly as I tell you to. You cannot change anything in the manner that I give it. Uh, you have to organize it and arrange it and build it a particular way. We see in Hebrews 8, 4 through 6. For if he were on earth, speaking of Jesus, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed, instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, speaking of the wandering tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he, Jesus, is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. So this is a shadow 
of things. Light casting a shadow from another object, not the thing that we should put our faith and hope in. Jesus describes, as described by John, to have come down and tabernacled with us. And yes, that word is tabernacled, if you will. Uh, John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh, the Word being Jesus, who was in heaven, and then became the Word, and the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us. And he beheld his glory, and we beheld his glory. The glory is only of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That word there for dwelt means to fix one's tabernacle, have one's tabernacle, abide or live in a tabernacle. This word is from the same family that is also used in Hebrews for tabernacle. They are the same from the same family, and one is really just maybe more of a uh, past tense form of it, but a primary root of that word means a shadow, shade caused by the interception of light, an image cast by an object and representing the form of that object, a sketch, outline, adumbration. I don't know what that means, but with the context, I'm assuming it probably means all those other things to some extent. Adumbration. So even in the even in the structure, the etymological structure of that word that means tabernacle to live here with us amongst us is the meaning shadow. It was meant to be a shadow of something greater. So we have these three gifts: gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold has uh, uses in prophetic scripture. Uh, it's all over Revelation, uh, especially in Revelation. There is a part where there is a description of the New Jerusalem that comes down, and the gold is so pure that it is translucent. It is see-through. I don't even know. I can't even imagine that. Uh, but I just I get blocked with you know this yellow hue. But it is so pure that it's translucent. It's clear. It's see-through. It, is, it represents uh, priestly duties. Many of the utensils, uh, well, all of, uh, I maybe say all of the utensils, the actual tools that they use, are made of gold in the temple, the, lamp, the lampstand, and as well, and especially the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is made of acacia wood, but it's lined with gold. The cherub upon, that sit upon the mercy seat are all gold. The mercy seat itself was made of pure gold, where the Propitiatory was placed. We'll talk more about the propitiation here. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. So they were all one big heavy piece. I can't imagine trying to lug that thing around. That's, a, that's massive. Continuing on. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and, the, and in the ark you shall put the testimony, which is the uh, commandments that were given to Moses that I will give you. But you see here, recognize that the testimony, uh, testament, there's a reason it's using all of this language. This was the first pro uh, promise. Christ is bringing a better second promise or covenant or testimony. But if you notice between all of these, we have said mercy seat a few times. Mercy seat uh, in the Septuagint is the same word as is used in passages like here in Romans. Romans 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through the faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe, for theirs is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus uh, Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a propitiation 
by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed so demonstrate uh, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just in the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That word for propitiation in the Greek is the same as the word for the Septuagint, which is Greek, the Hebrew Bible translated into Greek for mercy seat. And then we find <clears throat> in Hebrews 9, 1, then indeed even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary for a tabernacle was prepared. What is tabernacle? To dwell. He tabernacled with us. He dwelt with us. The first part in which he, uh, which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the, man, that had the manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat, which is the same mercy seat, word for mercy seat, in Exodus, and is the same word used by Paul for propitiation. They are all the same thing. They represent the offering that is given, the propitiation that is given to, to uh, take place your spot on the uh, crucifying cross of Christ. Those things in the temple represented what Christ was going to do and offer, and that's what we're looking at here. And gold, I believe. That gold is specific to uh, this idea of the mercy seat, uh, the idea of all of the emblems, uh, utensils that are uh, used, the sanctity of the temple, all of these things represent Christ in some way. Now we will move on to frankincense, that word. Frankincense was used on the altar of incense. It was a part of a much bigger mixture, but it, the mixture that they would use to put on the altar of incense <clears throat> was evenly proportioned between all of these. And if you read it, even on some commentaries, there's a neat story. Uh, it's, it, it's in the Jewish uh, apocrypha, if you will, I guess, or extra biblical commentaries, that there was a particular family who kept a seat, this recipe uh, and were the ones that the temple hired out to make this recipe. And they were very good at this recipe somehow, I don't know. But there, there was more than just what was uh, listed in uh, what we find in Exodus. But because they have more oral tradition as well that go along with the written tradition, there's apparently more spices and things that went into that, that mixture. I don't know. It's an interesting story, but what we have is what is in the Bible. There's about a handful of things that are mixed with frankincense equally, but frankincense is one of those primary fragrances that is burning continually from the altar of incense. The altar of incense, you have the Holy of Holies, if you remember the little top-down map, and then right, you have the curtain, the curtain that we are familiar with that tore from top to bottom when Christ was crucified. And then you have all of these other things uh, right next to the curtain is the altar of incense. And as it's burning, it's wafting into the Holy of Holies and it is creating an aroma that is pleasing to God. And he says, I will, and when you go back to the Exodus account, he says there, I will, I will be there in between the cherubim and I will, my presence will be there and I will smell this aroma. I will smell the burnt offerings and I will be pleased in these offerings that are given. Frankincense represents, uh, <clears throat> That part of the temple, I keep forgetting I have water here, I need it. Okay, the altar of incense is a symbol of prayer and intercession on the people's behalf, a part of daily priestly duty. It was offered as part of grain offerings as well, but not sin offerings. Frankincense was used for, memo a, for a memorial type of offering. Grain offerings were those that were given as memorial. God has blessed us with this abundance, this first fruit, this whatever it may be. So we, uh, they have a particular way in how they offer those things. They mix spices, they mix salt, they mix frankincense, and then they uh, offer that up to the Lord. But when there is a sin offering available with a caveat, they were not to use frankincense as a part of that. If there was a sin offering that could not be offered in the way it was 
expected with two turtle doves and, and such like that. They could use the grain offering, but they were still not allowed to use the frankincense. We have in Exodus 30, 34 through 38. I'll give a minute or a few seconds here for people, some people to get to it if someone wants to. Exodus 30, 34 through 38. And the Lord said to Moses, take sweet spices, stacti and anacha and galabanum. Right? And pure frankincense with these sweet spices, there shall be equal amounts of each. You shall make of these an incense, a compound, according to the art of the pure perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. And you shall beat, uh, beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony, again, the ark, in the tabernacle of meeting where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. But as far as the incense which you shall make, you shall not make it make any for yourselves according to its comp composition. It shall be to you holy for the Lord. Whoever makes any like it to smell it, he shall be cut off from his people. There's a threat and a warning that if someone does something other than what God has commanded them to do with this, in, this incense, they will be cut off from the people. So there is a threat and a warning there. It was, it was handled seriously and it was uh, to be holy and held in high regard. Leviticus says this, When anyone offers a grain offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fl a fine flour, and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. He shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest, one of whom shall take from it his handful of fine flour and oil with, the with all the frankincense, and the priest shall burn it as a memorial on the altar, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. The rest of the grain Offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is most holy. It is most holy of the offerings to the Lord made by fire. Frankincense was used for both inside and outside altars, meaning the altar of incense and the burnt offering of burnt uh, altar of burnt offering. Those are all a mouthful. And then here we have Leviticus five ten. And he shall offer the second as a burnt offering according to the prescribed manner. So the priest shall make atonement on his behalf for his sin, which he has committed. So this is if a person is, could not afford to buy the, the, the birds or the animals that they needed to offer, they could offer a grain offering in a particular way. And it shall be forgiven him. But if he is not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he who sinned shall bring for his offering one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour as a sin offering. He shall put no oil on it, nor shall he put frankincense on it, because it is a sin offering. I mean, it's interesting, and I don't know why, but there is meaning, and there is something about the fragrance of uh, frankincense and the offering within it that God has separated and set aside for. And I believe it represents Christ in some way, and maybe it is just simply that Christ is a sweet-smelling aroma when he is uh, prepared and, and offered as a sacrifice for man. Interesting as well, Paul references this kind of sweet-smelling aroma in Ephesians 5, 1 through 2. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And then we... Even in this world, 2 Corinthians 2.15, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. As the body of Christ, we are now included in that sweet-smelling aroma that Christ offered. Again, we did not, we had no part in that offering, except our sin needed to be paid for. All right, on to myrrh. This is another one of those weirdly spelled, and if you forget a letter, you get weird, other weird things, but uh, M-Y-R-R-H is correct, if anybody's looking at that and just baffled by why it's spelled like that. <clears throat> Used by some cultures for embalming and rituals surrounding dying and death. We read that uh, in John there where uh, Joseph of Arimathea provides these things and provides a burial place for Jesus and they prepare his body. Myrrh is a part of that process. It is a pri primary ingredient for the holy anointing oil. 
that is an official term, at least in the New, the New King James. The holy anointing oil was used to consecrate the temple in its entirety and everything within it, and they were not allowed to touch it. They had to handle it in a certain way and consecrate all of the, all of the utensils, all of the items, and the tabernacle itself was all consecrated with myrrh. Exodus 30, 22 reads, Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also take for yourself quality spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much sweet-smelling cinnamon, 250 shekels, 250 shekels of sweet-smelling cane, 500 shekels of acacia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hen of an olive oil, of olive oil. And then here, you shall make from these a holy anointing oil, an ointment compounded according to the art of the perf perfumer. The perfumer had a serious job ahead of them. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tabernacle of meeting and the ark of the testimony, the table and all its utensils, the lampstand and its utensils, and the altar of incense. One of the only times that they were really allowed to handle, and I'm not sure how they did it, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony. Somehow, I don't know, if they just flicked it in there, that's what most people think, is that they did some sort of, uh, you know, like if, you're, uh, if you've are if you seen some paint, uh, some artists when they're doing that kind of painting, and they're just fucking the stuff on the, I don't know if that's what they did, but that's the image typically people have of it, and that, and that may very well be, I don't know, if they had some big brush that they just kind of, with, from distance, just kind of mopped it. I don't know. But they had to handle all of these things, and they had to do it because there was a serious threat that if they did not, they could perish. There was, it was to be handled with the greatest of care. Going on, the altar of burnt offering, with its, all its utensils and the labor and its base, you shall consecrate them, that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them must be holy. You shall uh, anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister to me as priests. And you shall speak to the children of Israel saying, this shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. Jesus was also consecrated to do God's will. Multiple times we see some, something like that where he is recognized as the Messiah, as the anointed one. That's what Messiah also means. M the anointed one, the one who is anointed to do God's will, fulfill God's promise to Israel. Jesus sanctifies himself in John 1, 1 through 5, or I'm sorry, John 17, 1 through 5, if you want to follow with me in your Bible again. I'll give you a couple minutes, a couple seconds here. I don't have a couple minutes. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that you, your son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as have given him, as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I, which I had with you before the world was. And then we skip down in that uh, same chapter, down to verse 16. They are not of this world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I, have also, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. By the truth, he is the truth. He is the way, he is the life. He says of himself as well. And we see in the book of Hebrews that he, was, he is the great high priest to replace all that the law had established. And not to merely just replace it, but to, to take place of those things that were truly a shadow of what he was bringing and what he is still to accomplish. So uh, these are just some perspectives that I have found that I, I am more impressed with uh, this, these kinds of studies where we look at Jesus and we see how, how he says uh, all of that was written of me. Well, I want to know what was written of him and how 
uh, how that plays out in his own life. And, there, and there's details that I'm probably never going to find, but I love it when I stumble across, across a detail because it just makes it so much more uh, alive and it, and it uh, is so much more beautiful to see all that was going on in the Old Testament and see how it relates to Christ and what he has brought in his earthly ministry and what he is doing even now. So you don't have to agree with those. That's fine. Uh, I don't think they take away from the other ones. I just think that I find it fascinating that each of these gold, frankincense, and myrrh, even the way they're laid out, represents gold, the Ark of the Covenant, which is in the holiest place, uh, frankincense, which is on the altar of incense that's wafting in, and myrrh that is used to consecrate everything and uh, uh, in and out, all around, how Christ was also anointed and uh, to, to serve all of those functions on our behalf. So I hope those bless you. Maybe you'll think about them. Maybe you will move, leave, out, uh, leave this uh, church and say, I'm glad Josh is done talking so I can go home. And I just want to keep my regular thinking. That's fine too. But I hope this blesses you. I hope this deepens uh, some more understanding as to what we're celebrating here with Jesus Christ's birth, that it was not a, Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection ultimately was not a knee-jerk reaction to God in God's mind to our sin. It was planned all along. And even in Jesus' infancy or toddler-esque time of his life, whenever the Magi came and offered these gifts, they are representing all of those things. It was already known that, what, uh, that there was a purpose for this child. God knew from the foundations of the earth what Christ was going to do, and Christ gave himself to that plan. I hope this blesses you. I hope you have a good week. Lord, would you... Bless uh, this week for us, uh, that we would see you in the, in the things around us, uh, we would see you in your word, uh, that we would spend time in your word, and that we would truly uh, humble ourselves this season, not get caught up in the things that uh, so easily get caught up in. Um, we would choose to, uh, this time, to worship and honor you coming into this world for the purpose that you had uh, in your son Jesus Christ, the purpose that we celebrate Every day, his death, burial, and his resurrection for our sin. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.